switch sides here. I was on that side of the, <laughs> the mic before. Uh, so we are in week two of the series Grow Your Heart Three Sizes. We've been looking at the Grinch uh, kind of as like some of the, the theme of how we're looking at Christmas in light of, are we getting feedback here? It's me. Probably. <laughs> Gone. Oh, oh. All right, we'll see if it works. Okay. Um, so week two of this Grow Your Heart three sizes, um, but I'm going to jump movies for just a moment. Do we need this? Or? <laughs> All right, I'll let you guys figure it out. Um, I'm going to jump movies for a minute. If you know who Heather Nearhood is, she's attended here for a while. She may be the one person attending this church who likes Christmas even more than I do. Um, she had posted this the other day. All right. She might be the one person in this church who likes Christmas even more than I do. And this was posted just a couple days ago. If you're familiar with this movie, but it says, the older I get, the more I realize he wasn't that crazy. I identify with this. It started where I can kind of sympathize with him. That was a couple kids ago. I can identify with Clark Griswold because you love Christmas, you want it to go swimmingly, you have these big ambitions of what it's going to be, and inevitably parts, if not all of it, kind of fall apart. <laughs> Stuff goes sideways. And so some of us wonder, like, why do we do this to ourselves? Every year we cut down a perfectly good tree that was growing, we bring it inside so it can die, decorating Christmas lights, put it in our house, or we try out those fake trees. It never works. Nobody's fooled. They're an abomination. We listen to the same songs over and over and over. If it's not the same song over and over, it's something that was like butchered by a pop singer who had to rewrite this song that's been rewritten 50 different times and it never works. We spend too much, we eat too much. Noel listed a bunch of these last week. Why do we do this to ourselves? And some people don't. There's really, there's two kinds of people when it comes to Christmas. You've probably seen these floating around too. Like you're either a buddy the elf or you are kind of grinchy when it comes to Christmas. And there's a case to be made. The Grinches kind of do it a little more gracefully. They kind of avoid all the hype of Christmas. You keep your head down. You ride this thing out. But they kind of miss something. You know, they miss out on what a lot of us tend to enjoy from Christmas. But those of us, I'm on the Buddy the Elf side by far. If you're more of a Buddy the Elf, you get caught up in it and you have some good times. But oftentimes you end up either stressed out or kind of let down by it or often a combination of both. So this is where we're going to pick up the Grinch story. Last week we talked about, you know, kind of what was in his heart, that it's okay to be a little Grinchy about the Christmas holiday. It's not okay for that to transfer into how you treat or relate to other people. We're supposed to be loving. But, but we're going to pick up this Grinch story because he's up there, it is Christmas Eve, and he is hating the Who's. So I'm going to read along here, and we're going to find uh, this spot because it, you don't have to go too far into the story before you find this other significant turning point. So here it is. He's staring from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown. My wife wears this expression some mornings before she's had the first cup of coffee. <laughs> Ask the kids. <laughs> Coming down the stairs this morning, it was that. But coffee fixes it. At the warm-lighted windows below in their town, for he knew every who down in Whoville beneath, was busy now hanging a holly who wreath. And they're hanging their stockings, he snarled with a sneer. Tomorrow is Christmas. It's practically here. Then he growled with his Grinch fingers, nervously drumming. I must find some way to keep Christmas from coming. For tomorrow I know all the who girls and boys will wake bright and early. They'll rush for their toys. And then, oh, the noise, oh, the noise, 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 noise. There's one thing I hate, all the noise, 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 noise. And he lists all the stuff they do with these toys and stuff. He said, then the who's young and old will sit down to a feast. And they'll feast, and they'll feast, and they'll feast, 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 feast. They'll feast on who pudding and rare who roast beast. Ah, oh, roast beast is a feast I can't stand in the least. And then they'll do something I hate most of all. 
every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small. They'll stand close together with Christmas bells ringing. They'll stand hand in hand, and those who's will start singing. And they'll sing, and they'll sing, and they'll sing, 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 sing. And the more Grinch thought of this who Christmas thing, the more the Grinch thought, I must stop this whole thing. Why, for 53 years I've put up with it now. There's a whole separate sermon we could do there on, like, holding grudges. Like, if you have an issue with somebody, go talk to them. Be an adult. But we're not going there today. I must stop Christmas from coming. But how? Then he got an idea. An awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. You ever had this expression? You usually kind of wear it on the inside when it happens. You don't let the outward, but you kind of get that, <laughs> you know, you come up with something really good, usually kind of sneaky and sinister in some way. Unfortunately, some of us follow a very similar pattern in our own wonderful, awful idea when it comes to Christmas. See, Christmas celebration, it kind of baits the hook for us, and it promotes and promises an awful lot. We think about Christmas sometimes, and it's like, man, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be great. I mean, look at that. Who doesn't want to have this on December the 25th? You know, there's so much good stuff that can happen. And, you know, we, I, I at least, we work it up in our minds. You know, the kids are going to behave. They're going to be so grateful. The family's going to get along. Nobody's going to bring up politics at Christmas. We're going to be okay with our differences, right? The meals, not only are they going to come out right, but it's not going to be that hard. You know, it'll only take this long, right? You're not going to have any last-minute runs to the store. There's going to be a picturesque snowfall outside, but we forget that you have to shovel that. The gifts are going to be perfect. You're going to find the right deals, and it's going to match everybody. And, you know, honestly, it can be fun. It's usually not perfect, but, you know, we usually have good celebrations. But even if everything goes smoothly, we can still very easily sabotage ourselves. See, here's the problem with both us and the Grinch. We engage with a cultural Christmas over the real message of Christmas, and it sabotages the whole thing. The Grinch had that wonderful, awful idea. He intended to sabotage Christmas. We do it without even trying. We do it subconsciously. The Grinch engaged with this myth of what he perceived Christmas to be. He thought it was this one thing. He thought he could stop it by doing this stuff, and he set out to do it and sabotage it. And we, unfortunately, even though we're not seeking to sabotage Christmas, we engage in the myth. We engage with Christmas as we perceive it rather than what it is. Christmas, what it does is it very often over-promises and then under-delivers. We get too focused on the stuff of Christmas that we miss what the big message really is. Our priorities are mixed up. And I want to illustrate this by one of Jesus' stories. It's not a Christmas story, obviously, because if Jesus could teach it, he was you know, more than a baby at that point. But uh, it may as well be a lesson on how we handle Christmas. You might have heard this story before. You know, it's taught, you know, the kids can understand this one in Sunday school, but uh, it's the story of Mary and Martha. So uh, I'm not going to put it up on the screen. It's a fairly decent sized chunk. It's Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, if you want to follow along, but I'm going to read it here. So as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. Noel believes this to be like a biblical uh, account of mansplaining. <laughs> if you know what that means. <laughs> no, he corrects her. Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. Isn't that us at Christmas sometimes? There's so much going on. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. See, there's this perspective that we are meant to have, not just as Christ at Christmas time, but all throughout our lives. And we very often don't. Christmas is often one of the worst times. 
as I was putting this sermon together, there's verse upon verse that could go in here. Some of them really go into a lot of detail and some do not. Colossians 3, 2 boils it right down. It's nice and concise, kind of illustrates this perspective that we're meant to have. It says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. We're meant to walk with this understanding that there's more to life than just this. We have a plan. We have a purpose. There is a life after this that we should be looking towards. We have this eternal perspective, and we're supposed to set our minds on those things and not be so distracted by just what's going on here on earth. How do we factor that into Christmas? Because the trap is that we fall for this wonderful, awful idea of this temporary and wonderful and very often disappointing Christmas celebration. This underlying point in perspective comes from the Christmas story itself. It was delivered by angels to the shepherds that night of Christmas. And usually I use kind of the modern English translations, but I'm going to take a step back on this one and use, you know, this old King James because it worked out just fine for Linus in Charlie Brown Christmas. And even, if you got your veggie tails lore down, Larry the Cucumber. God is bigger than the boogeyman. He got his stuff mixed up. And behold, I bring you to great tidings of great joy. Um, so if it works for them. We, we, we've all heard this before if you've watched any Christmas specials. So I'm going to stick with kind of the old classic here. But this is the, you know, the angels appearing to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2. It said, and the angel said unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God on the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. You understand, folks in this day and age were looking towards a Savior. They knew that at some point God was going to show up, but they didn't necessarily know how. And God showing up in almost any context, you would expect this to be kind of like a terrifying thing. Like if a Zeus character suddenly arrives on the scene, you'd expect him to be like this massive thing. He's you know, all powerful. He's towering over everybody. He's destroying the bad stuff. He's bringing the wrath. He is setting things right. And instead, we get the hope of the world in the form of a baby boy. Not just the hope of the world, like not just a coming king, but he's bringing with it this promise that there is a purpose to our lives beyond just the here and now. There is the opportunity of salvation. And that salvation means whatever happens, ultimately we get to see Jesus at the end of it. It brings with it so much hope for us individually. And I just try and put myself in that perspective of like, what was this whole message there that was brought? What is this Christmas message? Because it is as relevant today as it was for him for them back then. These shepherds got some of the instructions because they were physically going to go see the baby Jesus, but yet that message is the same because that Jesus is the same Jesus that you and I pray to that we worship here on a Sunday morning. So if I'm on that hillside and an angel pops up, it's like, ah! you're going to jump and react to such a thing because this, you know, you're expecting this is going to be like Zeus is showing up and going to lay the smack down on things. Instead, what is the delivery? Fear not. Okay, I bring you good tidings. Okay, tidings of great joy. You have my attention. Glory to God in the highest. On earth, peace. Goodwill towards men. That is the nutshell of this message. Apart from the instructions of where you're going to find the baby, this is what the message from heaven down to these shepherds, down to earth, was. He condensed it down to these you know, six little things here. Is this the center of your Christmas? If this is not the center of your Christmas, you fell for a wonderful, awful idea. The who's in the story somehow got it because they lived like us. They had all the noise. They had the gifts. They had the toys. They had the stockings and the roast beast. 
And yet Christmas in that story had this staying power because even without all that stuff, Christmas came just the same. They reference that. We'll talk a little bit later on. You know, next week we'll be talking about you know, what that true meaning of Christmas was. And I can't skip by because as I was putting this together, like this message is not complex. It's hard to not fall for the trap, but even you know, the little kids get what Christmas is about if you teach them. It's a simple message. And even little Cindy Lou Who, who is no more than two, if you can see, look at that little smile. That's what Christmas is supposed to be. We need an, like this anchor of what Christmas really is. So it's not this trap that we fall for. There's a great example because we get to see how people processed the real thing. Because there's nothing wrong with, you know, the trees and the gifts and everything. Like, it's not, this is not a message to discontinue doing that. This is a message to keep everything at its center where it belongs. So how did people process the real thing? Back there, you know, the shepherds and all, they came, they found the baby Jesus, and there, there had to have been this exchange. Like, you know, Mary's just given birth, shepherds have shown up, and it's like, wow, how'd you get here? And so there had to have been, like, you know, these shepherds are busting at the seams, like, we just saw angels. Like, so I, there had to be an exchange of, like, you know, how'd you get here? We saw these angels. They delivered this message. So Mary's hearing these same words, this same message, even though it's not directly from the angel, she's hearing the same stuff that we just went over. How do they process this Christmas message? It's outlined, I give it Luke 2. Verses 19 and 20. Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. I'm going to challenge you this Christmas time. It's busy, I know. We're going to be there too. My family lives in Texas. Kira's family lives in Wisconsin. We're going to go to Wisconsin. We're going to start driving like Christmas afternoon. We've got like 10 hours out, 10 hours back, and that's if we don't hit traffic. And there are no potty stops. Four kids, we're going to have potty stops. My family's coming not too long after, you know, so we got to come home, make sure the house is ready. And, like, that's all good. I'm looking forward to it. But, like, I understand this trap. It's easy to get caught up in the nuts and bolts of it. If we're not intentional about it, you know, we miss this big message. So I encourage you, take some quiet time in this Christmas season. For me, sometimes it's when I'm alone. Like, the Christmas carols, like, you know, Hark the herald angels sing, joy to the world. When you slow down and absorb what the message of those songs are, you know, it, it, it awakens inside of you. You get, you know, that hope of Christmas. This was the master plan. This was Jesus coming to eventually die on a cross so that we can have a relationship with God. And all that that means, like that eternal perspective. You think about the things outside of just this world in the here and now. And it also awakens the love and the adoration that you should have, you know, for that Savior keeps those fires burning sometimes it's other stuff you know sometimes it's sitting like when all the lights are out the kids are in bed and it's just you and a christmas tree that's lit those are some great times to be able to pray thank god for all those things however it is for you find some of those times in which you can keep these things and ponder them in your heart but that's just what mary did the shepherds on the other hand what do they do The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. They were active. They were probably running through the town. They're boisterous. We just saw angels. We just saw the Savior. He's right here. He showed up. It's not Zeus coming to, like, lay the smack down on everybody, but it's a baby boy. God is up to something. And they're running around spreading this word and praising God. We just had a great night of worship last week that should you know kind of awaken those same fires it does the same thing in your heart to be able to awaken to the eternal things praise jesus for what he did make sure that you are having some time to have those moments in which you are praising god in which you can be excited about what's going on and not just in the muck of all the christmas celebration and the gift wrapping take some time for those things Praise God, whether that's music, whether that's prayer of thanks. You want that perspective that you have a purpose, that you have a future, and that part of that future is to see God someday, to actually meet that baby boy who was born in Bethlehem. Make the stuff secondary. 
I love the trees. I love the cookies. The gifts are fine. They're great. We have a lot of fun with all this stuff. You know, keep that up. Keep it healthy, but, you know, keep that up. There's nothing wrong with having family together. Like, it's a great thing, and it's a great way. But it should be painting the picture with this as the backdrop, and this is the center of what Christmas is all about. That message that was given on that hillside a couple thousand years ago, that message is still for us today. Make that the warm little center of your Christmas universe. It makes all the difference. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for a good Christmas celebration this year. We pray for good times with family and uh, for things to hopefully go smoothly. But Lord, above that, uh, we need this eternal perspective that you call us to. Lord, as we do get busy, uh, just help us to take that time and to keep you at the center of Christmas. This, this is all about your plan, Lord, and this is all about the hope and the future that you bring. Help us to not lose sight of that this Christmas. Help us to keep that at the center. Help us to build that relationship with you and always understand what this whole plan was. Amen.